I'm J. Rachel Edidin, and I'm half of J. and Miles Explain the X-Men, a weekly podcast all about the ins, the outs, and the retcons of comics' greatest superhero soap opera. Also co-host J. and Miles Review the X-Men, which you're watching right now, where Miles Stokes and I review all of the X-Books that come out in any given week. Now, today I am flying solo because Miles is off in New York working hard at New York Comic Con. If you are there, you should go say hi. He is going to be working at the Dark Horse, Dark Horse Comics booth all weekend. Um, he's going to be busy. He's mostly going to be on the sales side of the booth, but he will definitely have time for hellos and high fives. So yeah, if you're around, um, stop and say hi. Meanwhile, let's take a look at the books of October 5th, 2016. First up is Uncanny X-Men number 14. Written by Colin Bunn, with pencils by Greg Land, inks by Jay Lyston, and colors by David Curiel. I'm trying really hard to think of something good to say about this. Looking at the dialogue, looking at the issue in general, I can see where it could have been a good comic. But I have hit my Greg Land event horizon, because this issue is full of fight scenes that take me straight out of everything happening. It's full of dialogue that I feel like could have worked, but paired with the art that it is, it reads as overwrought and mannered and paced poorly. And just, yeah, the art just pulls this comic down so hard. Um, this sort of wraps up the arc that we've been going through where Magneto and Psylocke kind of face off over the fate of the uncanny team and end up fighting Exodus. And again, if you've got a comics background, it's easy to look at it and see what it could have been, and that makes the reality that much more frustrating. I Look, everything that I can say about Greg Land's art on this series, I have already said, and I'm not going to say it again. Um, I don't know. I'm, I'm just, I'm tired of this one. I am tired of feeling like I have to read around the art on a book. I suspect if Miles were here, he would be more upbeat about this one, but um, I kind of hit an event horizon with it. Sorry. Next up, we have All New Wolverine number 13, written by Tom Taylor, with pencils by Nick Varela, inks by Scott Hanna, and colors by Michael Garland. So, look, Nick Varela. I feel really bad jumping on the art on this and, and picking on art two issues in a row after, after reviewing Uncanny. And the thing is, Nick Varela isn't a bad artist. He is perfectly passable. He's a perfectly passable comics artist. His storytelling is fine. That's not good enough here. Um, this, is, this is a book where he has big boots to fill. I talked about this in context of Iguara, who I think was starting to rise to meet the standard set previously by um, David Navarro and Lopez and um, Marcio Takara. And again, that's a very high bar. But with that standard set for the book, just pretty good feels like a really significant downgrade. Um, this is, this, the story is, is, you know, this is the beginning of a new arc. And it's good. It's a good beginning. The writing is still spot on. Again, the art is not bad. Um, Varela is a much stiffer artist, and he's an artist who is a lot less expressive with faces and body language. So there's a lot less of sort of Laura's distinctiveness coming through, which I think was a huge selling point um, with previous artists. He's, again, he's not bad. He, he, I like his Gabby a lot. I love his Jonathan, his, 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 his actual Wolverine facial expressions. Um, have the spectrum expressiveness and distinctiveness that the human ones actually lack. So if, if I can, you know, if we can see that translated, I think I'll like this a lot better. Uh, I also haven't seen a lot of fighting from his Wolverine, at least not with the current version. I've seen her, you know, in her previous, previous incarnation as X-23. The story is good. Um, the story is interesting. And the story is once again pulling Wolverine back to her roots. There were connections to it in the first arc, um, the, the sister's arc. But this one is going much more directly to her past as X-23. And while I'm cautious about it, just because it's territory that's been trodden a lot and it's territory that's laden with some tropes that make me very uncomfortable, I'm excited to see especially how Taylor's going to handle it as an artist. He has been, he, you know, he's been batting 300 so far. He, is, he, has, he has hit everything beautifully and perfectly. And high truck going by outside. <laughs> and I, he's, he, is, he is a writer who I trust to handle this well, too. Um, 
As for the art, well, I hope it improves. Again, I'm judging it by what I recognize to be a probably unfairly high bar. But considering that we've seen at least two art teams nail it, I think it's a reasonable thing to expect from the next one. Last, but certainly not least, we have Death of X, number one. Written by Jeff Lemire and Charles Soule, with art by Aaron Cooter, and colors by Maury Hollowell. And I cheated. I got to read this early because we were interviewing Charles Soule um, last Saturday for the podcast. So Marvel hooked us up with an advanced review copy. And this, is, this series is a big deal. This is the series that is going to reveal at long, long last the noodle incident, what Cyclops did. It's going to tell us what happened with the X-Men during the eight-month gap. And it's going to presumably kill Cyclops, or at least kill adult Cyclops. Um, this, this is therefore also a series that feels very high stakes to me and that I am judging real hard. So there's that. That said, I think it's off to a really good start. I love the character voices. These are largely, with the exception of, um, I guess, Iceman and Magic, characters we really haven't seen since post-Secret Wars. Um, we've got Cyclops, Emma Frost, the, Stepford, uh, the, the three remaining Stepford Cuckoos, Gold Balls, and Iceman as, as a somewhat unlikely team. Investigating um, and discovering for the first time that the Terrigen Mists kill mutants. It's a really effectively done story. And most of all, it very effectively builds and presents the stakes for both the Inhumans and mutants. At the same time, the character writing is really, really good. Um, this is, these are characters I, have, I, I mentioned. I've, I've missed these guys. These are like my, my big dysfunctional family. Um, and I get to see them all again. Admittedly, I get to see them die, but yeah, X-Men, so it's Tuesday. <laughs> well, Wednesday. Um, the art is solid. It's not entirely consistent. I think that... Cooter is much stronger with backgrounds and with settings than he is with faces sometimes, although his faces are often really good, they're just not nearly as consistent. He is an amazing, amazing scene setter. He's really, really good, and he's especially really, really good in combination with, um, with Hollowell at just creating really terrific atmosphere, really terrific backgrounds. Um, Faces, when he's got close-ups, he pretty much universally nails. At a distance, they're simplified a little excessively compared to bodies in ways that, that read kind of bizarrely to me, but it's not a deal breaker by a long shot. Um, how much you like this book is going to depend a lot on how you feel about the inevitability of Cyclops and possibly some of these other characters dying. I will say also that this book includes a major character death that I've already seen a lot of strong reactions to online, and that actually, I'm going to follow this review. Um, Miles, despite being in New York and having spent all day setting up and troubleshooting electronics at the Dark Horse booth, sent me a video from his hotel room um, about his own very strong feelings about that particular death, which has spoilers in it, which I'm going to stick at the end of this review, so fair warning. Um, I have, again, kind of mixed feelings about that one. Um, I get why they chose the character that they chose to do that. And that's something that, that didn't actually make it into the episode, but that we talked to, and maybe we'll, maybe we'll put this up later. We can talk to him about it with Charles Soule um, at some length off air about. And I think his reasoning, having, having had that insight to the process, I think his reasoning was sound. But I also agree with a lot of the criticism I've been seeing in terms of, you know, it, it, it feels like a, a slightly cheap move. On the other hand, I don't know that there's a character who killing wouldn't have felt like a cheap move here. I'm thinking through the ranks of recognizable mutants, and I'm trying to think of another character who could have been slotted into that role who I'd feel better about seeing here, and the answer is that there really aren't any. That said, uh, or so, so yeah, um, Death of X has my endorsement recommendation, at least as far as the first issue. Um, that is me as a, you know, technical nerd and as a pretty hardcore Cyclops fan by, um, for whom X series sort of live and die by the quality of their representation of Cyclops. It's interesting. It sets up a really good story. I am, for the first time in like a year, actually kind of excited about finding out what happens next in the Noodle Incident, which is not a place I expected to find myself. Um, and again, while I, I understand the objections to it, I, I don't think there was really a great alternative at hand. That said, I'm going to turn it over to Miles. Um, 
The next bit of this has spoilers. If you don't want to see them, I recommend s skipping ahead to the pick of the week. Madrox? Really? Why? I am so not okay with that. I mean, don't get me wrong. I like Death of X number one. It was good. I think the writing is solid and the art is solid. And I'm happy to see the noodle incident finally being resolved. But Madrox got, he got a happy ending. Like, you don't do that. That would be like bringing Starman back to kill him in DC. I just, I don't feel good about that. All right, Charles Soule, I like your book, but it had better end up being super, super awesome to justify this. Or Madrox could just come back and that would be okay too. So that's three of three. Now, if I had to choose my favorite X book of the week, I'd go with Death of X number one. But altogether, my pick of the week isn't an X book. In fact, it's not even a Marvel book. It is Dead Man number one, Dark Mansion of Forbidden Love. Oh, yes. Yes, this is written by Sarah Vaughn with art by Lan Medina, colors by Jose Villarubia. It is so good. It is, I mean, it's, it's playing on gothic horror and gothic romance, but it's doing it in a distinctly updated format and context with characters and a setup that I absolutely adored. Um, I haven't enjoyed a, a new issue this much in a really long time, and I am so intensely looking forward to the rest of this series. It's brilliantly written. The art is spot on gorgeous, and yeah, um, Oh my god, it's so good. It's so good. So yeah, Dead Man number one. Panel of the week is from an X book. It is in fact from Death of X number one. And I'm going to show you the whole page first and then sort of zoom into the panel I'm talking about because it uses a trick I really like and haven't seen as much recently as we used to, I think before digital coloring became the background, which was basically going back to sort of intense line art or, or line art centric art to create a contrast or to show magic. Um, I think this panel does it beautifully. I think it's, a, it's set up really well in context of the page it's in. And I think it's, it's both a good piece of art as well as some really effective storytelling. And that is that. Thanks for watching. If you like what you've seen here but think it would be way better with a second host and without my face, check out the podcast, Jay and Miles Explain the X-Men. New episodes go up every Sunday at explainthexmen.com, also on iTunes and Stitcher. This week, we are jumping back across the pond to Excalibur as the cross-time caper begins. That podcast, these video reviews, and everything at explainthexmen.com, including recaps, uh, the video reviews I just said, visual companions to every episode, and much more, are brought to you by our Patreon subscribers. We are an entirely listener-supported project. Those are the folks who help us stay on the air and entirely ad-free. And if you want to join their August ranks, which you totally should, you can do it at the link either above or below this video, depending on where you're watching it. Otherwise, see you around. I miss him already.